six years, been working on AI for about five years, led the GPU efforts, and um, happened to see a, a YouTube video of me talking at Stanford. And that led him down the path of exploring whether posits could be, in fact, put into hardware and used for the AI applications of interest to Facebook. Uh-oh, what do you forget? <laughs> okay, so let's welcome Jeff Johnson of Facebook. Hello, everyone. Um, Jeff Johnson uh, from Facebook AI Research. Uh, so I work in the uh, systems research group, uh, you know, for systems for uh, machine learning at uh, Facebook. I've uh, written much of the GPU code that's used uh, both internally and externally at Facebook, uh, including much of the uh, PyTorch uh, GPU backend. Among other things I've worked on are like a high dimensional similarity search engine that's used a lot in production at, uh, you know, Facebook. Uh, and also, uh, say, like, you know, small tiled FFT convolutions that NVIDIA took uh, and put inside, like, the Kudinen library uh, for convolutional neural networks with uh, my colleague, uh, Nicholas Fasolake. So, uh, you know, still suffering uh, jet lag. I had to uh, take a mystery nap uh, yesterday afternoon. So, unfortunately, I, you know, missed some of the conference. But, uh, you know, today, you know, I guess I would be going in the opposite direction, uh, you know, caring less about precision. But you know, looking you know for use cases which are not you know traditional like you know high performance computing use cases, not for like weather simulation and other such things. We're going to get very quite sloppy with our arithmetic, uh, but you know to look for a radical increase in uh, like hardware efficiency, uh, for, especially for problems which do require the extended dynamic range and sort of floating point like representations in things which you can't necessarily map to fixed point. So there's definitely been a lot of uh, work and effort in, you know, like the hardware space, you know, over the past couple of years. Uh, I was at uh, ISCA in Los Angeles, uh, like last summer, where Hennessy and Patterson gave their uh, Turing Award talk, you know, where they talked to that, how this, you know, a lot of ways, you know, given the, you know, slowdown of Moore's law and the end of Dinard scaling, that, you know, it should be a new golden age uh, for, you know, computer architecture. And this is, you know, one of the segments that they had in their, in their slides, and pretty much the only mention of like arithmetic of, you know, certainly, the biggest, you, uh, you know, the biggest you know, factor for energy consumption, energy efficiency, is you know, like you know, memory transfers, you know, moving data back and forth, is you know, way more expensive than actually you know, performing operations on the data in a lot of cases. And you know, like you mentioned, well, of course you can eliminate unneeded accuracy. You can you know, go to you know, lower precision floating point, you know, just by you know, stripping off some bits and you know, maybe you know, smaller types. But like uh, underneath all the architecture, you know, the architecture is meant to route operands you know, together to your you know, underlying uh, arithmetic operations, you know, there really do need to be more options in this. So you kind of you know, wonder, and I think uh, you know, the first thing up top you know, really comes down to the posit idea. You know, are the bits that you're moving really meaningful? You know, like, are they a reasonably like, high entropy uh, representation of the data that you have? Uh, you know, if you attempt to reduce you know, precision in a lot of cases, you might be sacrificing the generality of your hardware that you have. Uh, you know, I do think, you know, especially a lot of ways that a lot of, uh, say, like machine learning inferencing accelerators, you know, might be overtelling their arithmetic, you know, by assuming that everything can, you know, necessarily be mapped to, you know, say, like 8-bit integers. Um, and, you know, like definitely, you know, mapping all of your work to fixed point, especially via, like, uniform quantization, uh, you know, like you might lose too much. You know, like, you know, can you tolerate, uh, like, approximation as well? You know, for substantial wins where, you know, like addition or you know, multiplication or other such operations, you know, may not necessarily, you know, be exact. But in the end, you wind up with an answer that is, you know, reasonably appropriate. And of course, you know, there's this, you know, trade-off, you know, like accuracy. Um, you know, the, the, the format in which you actually store data in main memory does not necessarily have to be the same format in which you operate on the data inside, you know, say like a CPU or an ALU or something like that. You know, I think that this also comes back to the posit idea of that, you know, definitely you can't, you know, necessarily operate on, you know, the posit encoding itself. It gets expanded into like a larger format and you can operate it inside of it, you know, but exploiting this difference and, you know, sort of like, you know, treating some of these, uh, you know, techniques like posits as, you know, like compression and decompression codecs, you know, like it can open up like a new world and allow you to use your like your memory more efficiently. So, you know, since I work in an AI research group, you know, I guess, you know, we'll start with machine learning, but my talk, you know, is more about like new hardware arithmetics, you know, which can be used for many applications. So, uh, like what is a, like a neural network? Well, I'm giving you a very, very simplified 60 second view. It really is just a collection of three different functions. One is, uh, you know, projecting data, like a linear function, 
into like a higher dimensional space, you know, say like a matrix multiplication or a convolution, something like this. So, and uh, you know, in this case, uh, oftentimes, you know, like the, this is a projection on an overcomplete basis, uh, you know, but it's, you know, putting it in a higher dimension so it's easier to sort of like, you know, separate, you know, like data in that higher dimension, it's easier to sort of like, you know, train and that because in higher dimensions, uh, you know, like you think about problems of, um, Think about problems of you know like uh, local minima versus global minima and uh, you know saddle saddle points and other such things. In higher dimensions, many of those problems go away, and there is you know a bunch of like theoretical results in this. And then once you're in this higher dimensional space, you have some function like a nonlinear function, you know, say like a, like a sigmoid or a rectified linear unit or something like that, you know, which performs the separation in that space. And then once you've you know performed that separation, then you you know pull pull back down and you project back down into like lower dimensional space and repeat this like over and over and over again. So like you know most neural networks you know have some collection of these you know three functions together. And the thing that is definitely most expensive to compute here is this function f. So um, you know this I'm only going to talk about say like your traditional supervised like neural network. Uh, you know a lot of people are familiar with you know ones for like image classification. You have, you know, like you, you take your raw pixels, you know, like your raw feature data, you put it in, you have a bunch of series of these, you know, sort of like functions where like F in this case for a convolutional neural network would be, you know, convolution still like a linear function. You go through this again and again, you know, project in a higher dimensional space, collapse, project, collapse, and eventually you get down to, you know, something uh, that, you know, much reduces the dimensionality of the data that you begin with. And you know, like the, the 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 training or like the loss function that you use is based on like you know, say the label for this image that you put in. So you know, hopefully, once you've actually like you know trained all of this, you know, spending like you know many petaflops, exaflops, you know, like zetaf zetaflops to actually you know train all of these you know parameters. You know, hopefully, you put in a dog on the left hand side and you get you know like the label dog on the on the right hand side. You know, but something that's interesting to note is that uh, you know this network had is definitely like over parameterized uh, because it's easier to train in higher dimensions. But you know, like that, uh, hopefully it's still like, you know, generalizes. It avoids like overfitting just on the, the data that you're putting in. It can deal with like noise. So the, the training of a neural network is, you know, definitely the computationally expensive thing. This is why everyone has been getting into AI hardware. This is why, you know, like GPU manufacturers are definitely interested. Um, and it, you know, like, and, Domain-specific accelerators are useful in this case because you know, they have you know, so-called high operand reuse. Once you've loaded your data from main memory, you know, performing a matrix multiplication or performing a convolution, uh, there's a lot that you can do on you know, sort of like you know, small caches or you know, data that you have in registers you know, to do this. So like you know, developing uh, fixed function hardware you know, makes this attractive you know, over using, say, like a general purpose you know, CPU or a GPU. You know, but in a lot of cases, you know, I think like uh, you know, the, the difference between the um, machine learning uh, people who are coming up with these models, you know, versus like numerical analysts, you know, like people here pretend they're still operating on the reals, you know, but um, you know, like the noise that's introduced, you know, with floating point quantization error, you know, it's still like unclear to me, you know, to what extent, you know, people actually depend upon that, you know, to help the training or hurt the training, uh, you know, but it seems, you know, very much the case that, you know, reasonably, both reasonably high precision and dynamic range is needed for this, especially in the case where, you don't necessarily know what you're going to get on the other side. If you're training, say, like a network that you've trained a thousand times before, you know, say like, you know, like a ResNet on like ImageNet, you know what you're going to get and you can play a lot of tricks with, you know, precision uh, that you can't do in a case where you don't necessarily know what you're going to get and if the system fails, did it fail because you don't have enough precision or dynamic range or did it fail because your architecture, you know, just won't work at all. So like, you know, the, the training alternatives, you know, like these are you know, like massive, you know, operations, uh, you know, so taking, you know, the thing uh, which I think, you know, started the, the, the uh, current explosion of work, uh, like Alex Kruskevsky back in uh, 2012, University of Toronto, his original like AlexNet, you know, training on the ImageNet data set and, you know, like basically blew all the classical techniques out of the water. Uh, the full training run, you know, takes, you know, 0.47 exaflops of, you know, total computation to train. And now we're up in, to like the, the zetaflop, you know, sort of like regime. You know, there's definitely, uh, you know, like any kind of like efficiency gains that can be realized, you know, they can definitely be useful in this case. You know, like today we're, you know, very much limited by like memory overheads and also by, you know, like multiply accumulated efficiency. Uh, you know, precision, you know, like reducing the precision, you know, may not necessarily, you know, like, 
help you know, solve all this, especially in the case where you don't know what you're going to get on the other side. If you've trained this network before and you know what the gold standard is, you know, then you can, you know, of course, you know, play some of these tricks. And certainly, uh, you know, what I think like most people and you know, many companies are looking at is like inference of neural networks. You know, once you've actually trained your neural network, you stick data in and you expect to get like a classification signal out the other side. Uh, you know, like, and definitely uh, using cheaper arithmetic, and there are, you know, probably like hundreds of papers over the past, you know, couple of years, you know, to try to do this, uh, to look at like ternary representations, you know, like even, you know, like single bit or two bit or, you know, fixed point or, you know, like other kinds of, you know, weird representations. Uh, like in some cases, you know, they might actually be overfitting on the problem. And, you know, like you may not necessarily want to actually build a general purpose accelerator, you know, which is dedicated to, uh, you know, ternary representations and ternary arithmetic. So the reason why you can get away with this is uh, like networks, like neural networks are, you know, large part, like, you know, quite, um, you know, based on the way that they're trained and also, you know, based on, you know, the classification scheme, you know, they're, they're quite resistant to noise, you know, especially, you know, quantization error. Of course, uh, if you knew something about the neural network, you can exploit noise. You know, so here's a here's a picture where, uh, you know, by by following the gradient of the neural network, you can you know convince a neural network that say you know this is a picture of a starfish, you know, with high you know certainty, uh, you know, but that's using uh, like noise in such a manner with also knowledge of like the neural network, and you're sort of like you know following the gradient down, so you can you know fake the uh, like neural network like an adversary you know could do this. You know, but the uh, noise that's introduced by, you know, quantization error, you know, would largely be, like, uncorrelated with this. And so, like, you know, quant so these networks, uh, because the, the training set, you know, does have, like, you know, many examples, you know, which is also sort of like a form of noise, and there's, you know, a sampling error and other such things involved, you know, they can be resistant to, you know, quantization noise, which is, like, uncorrelated uh, to a lot of this. So, uh, so why am I here? Uh, so over the past two years, uh, I've been, you know, sort of like thinking, like, you know, what kinds of, you know, like other numerical alternatives beyond this, you know, like fixed point, uh, you know, say, you know, quantization, or just, you know, taking your standard floating point representation and, you know, chopping off a couple of bits. So I had a paper at, uh, like, NeurIPS uh, last year, you know, where I, you know, like built, like, hardware version, also evaluated, uh, you know, the posit, and ran it on, say, like, you know, the full, like, ImageNet uh, validation uh, set. And, you know, came up with this, like, weird uh, log representation, which I'll get into in, like, a little bit, um, where in some of these cases, you know, definitely, like, you know, positive arithmetic in, uh, like, in hardware, you know, it does have, you know, a lot of the same issues as far as, like, hardware efficiency as, like, you know, normal floating point representations do. You ultimately, like, unpack the posit into, like, a standard floating point representation, operate on as you would, like, normally, and then, you know, sort of, like, you know, pack it back. Um, you know, but the, uh, you know, like, I think that the trick here, and, like, I had in my paper, where I actually showed this weird log representation, which I'll talk about in a little bit, you know, can actually be, you know, quite competitive against, like, integer multiply add, and it's effectively the same, like, energy and area, like, hardware. Uh, you know, like, the utility of, like, doing that is, is probably, you know, kind of, like, limited. Uh, you know, like, ideally, we'd like to take, you know, some of these representations and some of these alternatives and extend it to training and elsewhere. So, you know, like, what should we, where should we look for alternatives? You know, well, I think there's, like, a big literature of, like, alternatives, uh, you know, like, alternative ways of performing arithmetic and hardware that, you know, people should be, you know, taking a look at. Uh, you know, definitely with uh, like, you know, stochastic computing, you know, binary stochastic numbers, uh, you know, arguably first introduced by von, von Neumann in the uh, 1950s. Uh, you know, this idea of like non-integer and multiple base number systems, uh, you know, I think that was, you know, like introduced to like recently. Uh, you know, f logarithmic number systems, uh, these nonlinear maps, and I think also with uh, one of the like unum types, uh, you know, like, John Gustafson, you know, proposed like a reciprocal map so that reciprocals of numbers, you know, would also be represented in the number systems. And the idea of like, you know, like this is, you know, like different ways that you can perform uh, computations, but also you have a choice on how you represent your data stored in memory. So the idea of like floating point tapering, entropy coding, uh, you know, like how can you, you know, tailor how you quantize numbers to the actual data distributions that you have, uh, which is also related to the idea of, you know, say like, you know, vector quantization, product quantization, scalar quantization, you know, via k-means and those, you know, sort of like representations where you learn the actual like data distribution of the uh, stuff that you have. 
So, you know, taking a lot of these ideas together, and, you know, this is what I talked about in my paper and like NeurIPS and, you know, like I've extended it since then. So I've kind of come up with a uh, sort of like a hybrid of like traditional floating point with uh, logarithmic number systems with, you know, sort of like, you know, tunable accuracy and tunable efficiency trade-offs. So we wish to uh, exploit the advantage of logarithmic number systems where you have no hardware dividers, no hardware multipliers, square root is, you know, like, you know, quite easy, uh, you know, but of course addition and subtraction are hard with, you know, like numerical systems where addition and subtraction are sort of like easy. And, like I'll show that you can get like up to, you know, sort of like a 3x energy advantage, uh, you know, compared to uh, standard floating point with this, you know, sort of arithmetic. But of course, you know, for as with regards to the numerical analysts, you know, things become quite sloppy here. There's no longer, you know, sort of like a standard framework in which you can analyze this, you know, like your error depends is no longer, you know, guaranteed to be like an average of like, you know, a half a unit in last place and other such things. And there are different knobs that you can tweak and sometimes, you know, things can go quite wrong. Um, and, you know, combining it with the idea of, you know, this uh, like entropy coding, the number one cost, uh, like in hardware, is moving data back and forth between main memory, moving it from like DRAM to SRAM and from like, you know, flip flop to flip flop. You know, like, are the bits that you're actually moving around like meaningful? You know, I think there's a lot that you can do to sort of like, you know, maximize bit information, uh, you know, where you actually need to store it for a longer term. You know, whereas, you know, like while you're actually operating on stuff in place, you know, taking the ideas of, you know, say like the Kulish uh, long accumulator, uh, you can, you know, be more accurate while you're performing you know, temporary calculations. And then the point in time when you actually need to write out the results in memory, you can, uh, you know, sort of, you know, compress it and quantize it in different ways. And so like this, you know, idea of like dealing with approximation, you know, I think the idea of like, well, like under certain regimes, you might want to be like more accurate, you know, say like a Kulish accumulator, the thing I just mentioned, but you, uh, you know, say like, you know, we'll quantize it, you know, further than you do, or you only, you know, sort of like exactly accumulate some of the data, but not all of the data, uh, you know, say like in a matrix multiplication, uh, you know, to get sort of like the exact result, you need to look at like an entire, you know, like row vector from one matrix and an entire column vector from another matrix. That might be impractical to do as far as like, you know, streaming in memory. You may only want to do that on some portion of that. You know, this definitely makes like analyzing the error and, you know, for these kinds of arithmetics to like harder. So if we look at uh, what like a traditional logarithmic number system does, uh, you know, so if you think about like, you know, floating point, a uh, collection of like a integer uh, exponent along with a uh, sort of like a fixed point significant, uh, logarithmic number system sort of like moves all of that up into the exponent. So you can represent, you know, values here like, you know, like two to the minus, you know, 0 0.6875. And that's represented as like a fixed point number. So this, you know, sort of turns multiplication and division into like addition and subtraction on the fixed point number. Uh, you know, like addition becomes a lot harder, uh, you know, which I'll talk about in like a little bit. And of course, so like in a logarithmic number system, negative numbers in the value zero are outside the, the uh, domain, so you have a you know, special representation for those. So um, you know, the idea of the logarithmic number system, I think, has you know, definitely been around for you know, 40 years or so, you know, but like not too much you know, work has, done, has been done with it. And I think the, the issue with that is that uh, addition and subtraction are you know, very hard. Uh, so like, so if you look at um, you know, the logarithmic representations, these numbers uh, x and y as these uh, you know, sort of like fixed point numbers i and j, as I mentioned earlier, uh, multiplication turns into addition, division turns into, into subtraction, and square root you know, just is divided by two or you know, shifting your fixed point uh, word towards the uh, least significant bit. But to evaluate uh, how to add or subtract uh, like two logarithmic domain numbers, you have to evaluate these two uh, nonlinear functions. Um, and uh, there are also sort of like other weird things. So if you think about like in floating point, um, you know, of course you um, can represent like integer, you know, values exactly, you know, say like single precision floating point, I think up to like, you know, to the 24th. Uh, in the logarithmic number system, the only integers, uh, if say base two logarithmic number system, the only integers that you can represent exactly are, you know, powers of the base, you know, like one, two, four, eight. You know, so if you wanted to, you know, divide some value by three, uh, well, you have a problem like you know, representing three exactly. You know, but to note that in uh, traditional binary rad radix uh, floating point, you have a similar issue. You know, the idea of that, you know, say like you know, 0 0.1, which can be represented exactly in a decimal radix floating point, you know, can't be ex represented exactly in a binary radix floating point. So, like in many cases, you know, representation is, uh, you know, sensitive to both the uh, domain, you know, whether it's the, like a 
what I call linear domain or logarithmic domain and the radix you know, that you have. So uh, how do you actually implement these uh, addition subtraction functions? Well, you know, people before in the past have had to cook up you know, quite massive uh, lookup tables and you know, piecewise linear approximation, which in often cases you know, reintroduces multipliers that we got rid of. Uh, you know, many, you know, tens of thousands of, you know, like bits of storage, you know, to sort of like represent this. Um, and, you know, like the error that you actually get for your addition and subtraction functions is, you know, very much dependent upon how accurately you sort of like represent this. Um, and the problem with uh, logarithmic number system um, addition and subtraction is uh, you have to sort of like represent all different range of differences. Uh, you know, like you, you could uh, add your, you know, largest possible number, largest possible positive number, oh well, a very large positive number with a very small number, uh, you know, as long as, you know, it does actually like increment it, like all those range of differences that you actually have to add. You know, there's also like a big literature on, you know, various ways to, you know, try to jump through this. You know, so like all the hardware resources that you've saved on avoiding, you know, multiplication division, you know, like get replaced by these, you know, sort of like massive LUTs or like other such architectures, you know, to do this. And another thing to consider, you know, especially since, you know, I think, uh, you know, since, since I think, uh, you know, like, definitely like your YouTube video is, you know, kind of like introducing me the idea of, you know, Kulish accumulation and, you know, like exact accumulation, you know, there's no analog to this in a logarithmic number system. Um, if you wanted to accumulate values more exactly, you would need to, you know, blow out the size of these, you know, tables anymore. Uh, you know, so like, especially if you want to apply like a, a logarithmic number system to uh, linear algebra where you're, you know, performing, uh, you know, like vector vector product or matrix matrix product, um, and you want to accumulate, you know, like these sums of products exactly, you know, like this becomes like de a definite issue. All the, you know, typical problems that you have with, you know, like regular floating point, you know, become amplified in some ways with the logarithmic number system. Like sure, your multiplication division is now exact, but your, you know, like addition, you know, like has problems. So, um, you know, like note that, you know, like this logarithmic domain, um, you know, the concept of fuse multiply add, you know, like no longer really applies. If you think of like in a linear domain, you multiply like two binary numbers, you wind up with a number that's, you know, twice the size of what you wind up with. Uh, in the logarithmic domain, you know, like we can preserve that accuracy uh, exactly, but the, you know, the addition is no longer exact, you know, but if you wanted to, you know, this uh, few square root add, you know, could be a thing because you do, you know, would potentially lose, you know, one bit per of precision half the time uh, if you wanted to, uh, you know, take a square root in the logarithmic domain. So what we want is kind of like a hybrid system. Uh, we want to avoid all of the hardware multipliers and dividers, you know, which you get, which you, uh, you know, like are a huge issue in floating point, especially, you know, like the largest, you know, sort of like energy cost as far as, uh, you know, combinational logic is concerned. Uh, we want like exact accurate multiplication division. And we also want like, you know, reasonably accurate and efficient addition and subtraction. Um, you know, I'm looking for this for like linear algebra and like other such use cases, you know, which is very useful in uh, machine learning would be useful. So of course, you know, going back and forth, you know, like you would introduce error. So uh, you can sort of, you know, think of like, okay, if you want to have like a hybrid system, like are your ultimate values log domain or your ultimate values linear domain? You know, one of the earliest, uh, you know, kind of like, you know, papers, you know, like in, um, Computer science about like using uh, logarithmic representations, uh, you know, to sort of like you know speed up multiplication. You know, st started with the assumption that the you know values were ultimately like linear domain representation. You approximate uh, multiplication via the logarithmic domain. This uh, Mitchell paper in 1960 in 1962, but I think like here like we're you know typically evaluating sort of like you know sums of products. Uh, you know, so you. Uh, you know, like we, if we can avoid the, you know, like the, the error and, you know, multiplication and then, you know, have, you know, something which can sum up you know, reasonably well. You know, I think, you know, starting with a primary like log representation, you know, sort of like, you know, makes more sense, you know, to me. Um, and then, you know, use like a linear addition. So like you multiply like two logarithmic numbers, you convert the result into like a linear representation and then you can add, you know, like in your typical form there. So when you convert back and forth between the logarithmic domain and the linear domain, you know, of course, you know, that you still have like a LUT or you still have like hardware machinery, except the thing to note is that the machinery that you need for this is way smaller than what you would need for, uh, you know, performing the addition and subtraction function with a logarithmic number system. 
So uh, you only need to represent, you know, sort of like the fractional bits, you know, rather than like the entire, you know, thing, and this, you know, so that substantially, you know, like reduces the hardware cost. Uh, I mean, uh, like I call these functions, you know, p and q, p to go uh, from the log domain to the linear domain and back. Um, you know, then you can apply like the normal floating point methods. So, you know, this is what we have. Uh, you know, like we have a system where, you know, like our numbers are logarithmic domain and we perform a multiplication in the log domain and uh, you can accumulate the values, you know, by using like a normal, you know, like, uh, you know, like an exact, you know, fixed point accumulator so you can be reasonably exact with all of your additions, you know, except note this is not the exact answer of like everything. Um, you know, like unlike, you know, say like a fuse multiply add uh, into like a Kulish accumulator, you know, where you are, you know, performing the exact representation of this. Uh, and then you convert back to log domain when you're done. And you can also make it cheaper by using just, you know, like a floating point adder um, instead of, you know, like the Kulish accumulator whose cost would, you know, scale, you know, like, you know, tremendously with the uh, dynamic range that you have. So, uh, you know, like you have these different parameters that you can use to adjust like the accuracy of like how accurately do you want to represent linear to log and log to linear, you know, conversions, these like alpha, beta, gamma parameters. Uh, you know, so like when you go from log domain to linear domain, uh, you get to choose like how many, you know, say like I have uh, five fractional bits in the log domain, you can produce six fractional bits in the linear domain or seven or, you know, so on and so forth. Uh, because you would need like, you know, effectively like infinite precision in order to, you know, represent the log to linear and linear to log, you know, mappings. Um, you know, so like typically, you know, like I explained explain this in my paper, you can sort of like, you know, look up this, you know, but I think the, you know, what makes most sense is if you ensure that, you know, the, you convert a value from log to linear and then back to log, you want it uh, to sort of like be the identity. So you need, uh, you know, like these values to be this way. So, you know, what does this actually give you? Well, this gives you, uh, in arithmetic, you know, where multiplication is uh, substantially cheaper than addition, but you can still like add numbers and you can still like do it with very reasonable accuracy, which I'll get into. So, um, you know, say like, you know, this log B float representation versus, uh, you know, standard, uh, you know, floating point, you know, like you can be like, you know, nine times or 15 times like lower energy, to, you know, to perform the multiplication. The addition is about the same cost as what you would have like normal floating point representation. So in the end, uh, sorry, sorry, we're gonna move, skip ahead. So like in the end, uh, you wind up with arithmetic that is you know substantially cheaper. So uh, this is an evaluation uh, like a synthesis at uh, like a, using a 28 nanometer uh, semiconductor library with the uh, synopsis tools. You know, sort of comparing these uh, numerical representations with you know like traditional like fuse multiply add. I think the interesting thing to note here is that you can uh, have like a logarithmic, you know, sort of like a log posit, and you, you get like an extended, you know, like dynamic range, uh, like that in my paper, like I use as a, you know, pretty much, you know, like drop in for a standard 32-bit floating point, take all the parameters that you had originally, everything still works, and it, you have about the same uh, like energy efficiency that you have with a, like an integer multiply add. You know, but, but I think this becomes like the most interesting thing here, that the energy efficiency that you have, you know, compared to say like a normal floating point fuse multiply add is like three times lower. Um, and this, you know, like, uh, you know, like this here, uh, you know, I think is like the thing which, you know, makes this most interesting. Uh, because, you know, especially for like, uh, machine learning accelerators, uh, because there is like high reuse, the overheads of like moving data back and forth between main memory and your processor are like amortized uh, because you know, once you bring it in, you can perform like many, many operations. So to get the throughput that you want in this case, you have to like, you know, pack your accelerator with, you know, like tons of like multiply add units. And the fact that you have like, you know, three times like lower, uh, three times higher energy efficiency, you know, by doing this, uh, is, you know, quite interesting. So I'm gonna, sorry. So, uh, you know, what, what about the, like, accuracy of, you know, the representation that you have? So uh, if we take, like, a log representation, and, you know, there are these, you know, parameters which I have, you know, which, you know, define how exactly, like, the accumulation, the log to linear, linear to log, you know, conversions have, uh, you know, like, as you increase it, you know, like, you get, like, more accurate, and you sort of, like, you know, will tend to converge on the answer that like a logarithmic number system gives you. 
you know, but a lot of the representations I've been using with are sort of like here, where like most of your errors are, you know, quite well bounded, but you have, you know, like some, like, uh, you know, possible additions and uh, subtractions, you know, which can kind of like, you know, go out. And I'll show in a little bit that, you know, this typically does not actually, you know, cause, you know, that much of an issue. Uh, especially if you're, you know, performing uh, many sums over and over again, you know, as would be standard in linear algebra, because we can combine, uh, like, the idea of, like, the more exact accumulator with a logarithmic number system, that if you're performing, you know, many, many sums, you can be, like, you know, way more accurate than what you would be with, like, a traditional logarithmic number system. And note that this line it would basically be the same with standard floating point uh, as well, because your accumulator, you know, sort of like loses precision as, as you accumulate into the same value like over and over again, except now we have a rep representation where there are no multipliers, hardware multipliers, you know, but our accumulations are like reasonably accurate. So, you know, like definitely in, given this approximation, we can still be like, you know, more accurate overall. So like this is uh, comparing like the error relative to like a 64-bit uh, you know, like standard, uh, you know, uh, double precision uh, floating point representation. So, like the benefits of this, you know, as I said, uh, you know, we get to avoid all the multipliers. Uh, you know, we get to have like a more precise accumulation. Um, you know, if you cared about uh, like reproducibility, like some order independence, you can get that as well. You can sort of like you know plug in a Keolish accumulator. I think you know definitely for a lot of like you know low power use cases. You know, like the, the Keolish accumulation may not be interesting. Um, and of course, you know, I think the original idea of like the Keolish accumulation, if you look at like uh, Ulrich uh, Kulish's books about you know, like, you know, creating sort of like number systems, you know, where you can, you know, represent, you know, like these, uh, you know, like basic linear algebra operations exactly. I think like here, because we're already approximate in a lot of ways, you know, that may not necessarily, you know, be as important. And I think if you look at what actually happens in hardware, in a lot of cases, uh, you know, people, We'll have a reduction tree, you know, where you sum, you know, sort of like every pair of values together, and you sum all of those pairs of values, you know, together, uh, you know, so so that you don't actually need to sum two values together, write it back out to the register, and bring it back, and kind of like you know go back and forth. You can do something like this as well, except of course, you know, these are just you know sort of like you know floating point adders. If you want to use a traditional logarithmic number system, you're going to have to stamp out this, you know, like massive LUT every single time. So, uh, you know, like this is all, you know, well and good, but, you know, like note that I said that you still, you know, we avoid the massive uh, LUT that you have or like, you know, hardware, you know, like uh, representation, you know, for the uh, add and subtract function, you know, but we still have this, you know, like log to linear and linear to log, you know, conversion function. Well, yeah, I think you can still win, you know, compared to a standard floating point up to about like, you know, say 13 bits of fractional precision. You know, like the, the question is, you know, like I think there are a lot of use cases you know, where you want to go beyond that. You know, like, what about, like, higher precision? Uh, you know, so there are, like, you know, lots of uh, strategies, you know, people have come up with, um, you know, like, over the past, you know, 40 years. Uh, you know, of course, the, you know, like, there are the basic LUTs, you know, which are, which are fine, you know, but that strategy, you know, will tend to die off. Uh, you know, traditional hard, hardware algorithms like, you know, Cortic uh, and, like, high radix, you know, versions of this, you know, which can be used, you know, which also, you know, sort of, like, have problems. You know, think like using uh, like, you know, piecewise linear approximation for these LUTs, you know, like reintroduces the multipliers that you got rid of. But I think there are some, uh, you know, quite interesting, um, you know, papers, you know, which give you, you know, different ways. I think one of the most interesting one here is uh, this Paul paper, which is actually sort of like a weird combination of uh, using uh, logarithmic multiplication to sort of fake a uh, like you know piecewise linear you know a multiplier that you would have in a piecewise linear, and you can get up to say like you know 20 bits of precision you know like you know fairly cheaply, and uh, definitely for like linear algebra I think that you know converting a log number to linear number by you know raising it you know to the, to the power of x is the thing that needs the most optimization because you're going to be doing this again and again and again. So um, you know like. Once you have this arithmetic in hardware, you know, like, we want to use it. We want to see how applicable it is, you know, for many use cases. Uh, you know, but I think there's some interesting things that happen in this arithmetic. So if you think about, like, a lot of, uh, you know, work that people have done uh, has been, you know, trying to avoid multiplication. Uh, you know, take this uh, original, like, 
Wondergrad's original matrix multiplication algorithm, not the crazy ones. From 1968, you do this simple substitution to you reduce the number of multiplications, increasing the number of additions. Uh, you can't, these sorts of tricks, you know, like no longer, you know, really make sense because we have an arithmetic where multiplication is, you know, nine to 15 times cheaper than addition. And you lose every time you, you know, perform a multiply and kind of like, you know, go back and forth, you sort of like losing this. You know, so like there are a wide range of these tricks that, you know, people have. Uh, you know, one which I think is most interesting, you know, definitely for convolutional neural networks. Uh, there's a paper by uh, Levine and Gray uh, back, I think, like 2016, 2015 or so. Um, you know, so like I, I worked on sort of like the FFT paper and then they came out with this paper looking at uh, Winograd's uh, like minimal filtering algorithms back from the 1960s, which also, you know, perform, you know, some of you know, it's sort of like, you know, this, you know, sort of like trick, uh, you know, applied to, you know, filtering and FFTs and other such things, you know, where you reduce the number of multiplications that you have, uh, you know, so like if you were, you know, for a convolutional ne neural network, uh, you know, say like a three by three filter, so you take a four by four input patch, a three by three filter, and a two by two output. If you just wanted to sort of write the naive loop, you would have 36 multiplications and 32 additions. This transformation, you know, converts it to this, uh, you know, but if you were to just, you know, sort of like implement this in hardware, um, you know, people for, uh, you know, traditional, uh, well, I guess, you know, traditional in the sense of the past couple of years, neural network accelerators have, you know, like done this sort of thing. But if you were to sort of like do this in this arithmetic, uh, you know, like, well, we're turning a lot of our multiplications into additions. And if you just, you know, perform the naive sum, you know, this is like costing you more, you know, but I think the thing is that this is like a tile-based algorithm. And once you, you know, process it this way, you can sort of like, you know, hold on to this, you know, but what does the error look like? Well, uh, it actually turns out that, you know, compared to, you know, pretty much, uh, you know, standard floating point, you know, this uh, weird approximate arithmetic, you know, gives you about the same answers, you know, that you have, you know, like maybe, maybe even slightly better. And of course, you know, like you always have the choice of, you know, using like a more accurate accumulator. And because you've eliminated all like multipliers and dividers and all of that stuff, you can spend more of your chip area and more of your energy on making your accumulation like more accurate. And you would still like, you know, went out over uh, standard floating point. If you want to look at, you know, sort of like other uh, like algorithms, you know, like here, uh, you know, say like uh, LU decomposition where you decompose and then we, you know, multiply back to sort of like you recover the original matrix, you know, things same, you know, are roughly in the same regime, uh, like maybe a little bit worse. Like at, you know, like for, I've tried this on like FFTs and IFFTs and other, you know, such algorithms, uh, and it, you know, typically seems to be, you know, within like, you know, plus or minus, you know, like one, you know, fractional bit of precision with, you know, like doing all the work and sort of like standard floating point. And, you know, I guess if you wanted, uh, you know, sort of like a visual image, uh, given this arithmetic, um, you know, like you can, you know, build a ray tracer with all the, you know, weird, uh, you know, like inverse square root and divide and multiply, you know, we're just with a bunch of, you know, like adders, you know, shifters and leading zero, zero counters, you know, no multiplication, no evaluation of square root. And it still like roughly works, um, you know, so this is using a, you know, like a bit accurate uh, emulation of like the arithmetic and sort of like, you know, sweeping through like, you know, many different precisions um, and sort of curious, uh, you know, definitely this is a, you know, it tends to be like a more, you know, precision uh, limited workload. Uh, if you notice that, um, you know, say, I think I rendered these at like 512 by 512. So even in like low precision, like all the arithmetic is, you know, like done on this type, um, you, you don't have enough uh, precision with the like limited types to even sort of like shoot 512 rays, you know, like many of them end up, you know, sort of like, you know, mapping to the same point like up there. But I think that, you know, this just sort of shows that it is sort of like a normal arithmetic. Like, yes, I haven't done, you know, tons of numerical analysis on it, but you can sort of like, you know, use it for computer graphics and, you know, potentially like many other use cases. So, you know, there's this thing that I was talking about earlier about like, you know, multiplication, like we would like to avoid you know, like um, converting, you know, like all of these, uh, uh, converting all of these multiplications to additions, uh, you know, but like many algorithms, you know, well, you'll combine like multiplication and addition together. Uh, so like in our arithmetic, uh, you know, we tend to want to prefer to coalesce all the additions together and coalesce all the multiplications together. You know, so if you had, you know, some operation, 
uh, like like this, uh, you know, of course, the you know typically typically you know like on um, you know it typically you know, like normally you would you know sort of like move this out anyways if you care about you know the multiplication, but in some cases uh, you would actually want to like you know go ahead just so you can like sum up everything together instead of sum then multiply then sum. Um, so you know I think there's some interesting you know potential cases where uh, you know things which could you know actually affect you know heuristics and compilers if you wanted to like write more complicated expressions on you know like how frequently do you go back and forth you know between the log and linear domains. So you know what's okay so we have this you know fancy sort of weird approximate arithmetic. Uh, you know, which can like help redu substantially reduce the, the hardware overheads of the operations themselves. You know, but I think like the sort of like the number one concern, uh, you know, definitely for computing these days, uh, you know, everything from, you know, sort of like, you know, tiny inferencing chips to, you know, massive uh, HPC, you know, supercomputer systems is that, you know, like the, the energy efficiency is really like dominated by, you know, the size of the words that you're sort of like, you know, moving back and forth. You know, the, the stuff we're, you know, hearing about yesterday of like, well, you know, can we use, you know, half precision or single precision floating point when double precision floating point, you know, would have been like, you know, a traditional case. Uh, you know, so this thing, you know, I was talking about earlier about like, you know, reusing things, uh, like Bill Daly calls this, uh, you know, like amortization by like, you know, chunky operations. If you can bring data in, do a bunch of stuff on it and write it back out, you know, like you don't have to deal with these like overheads as much, you know, but there are definitely lots of workloads that in a roof line model sense, you know, don't have this property, you know, like matrix multiplication and convolution have this property, but, you know, say back earlier, you know, just applying like a sigmoid function to data, that's just very much like a pointwise operation. You're loading the data in, you're only, you know, doing sort of like, you know, one operation per data and writing it back out. Um, you know, like you still have like these problems, you know, like in a, lar a large case, I think like people have been jumping to AI hardware is because, you know, convolution has like how high al algorithmic reuse, you know, but there's still like many uh, operations in which you'd want to perform on data, you know, which uh, are, you know, very much uh, memory bandwidth uh, limited. So I think that this is the interesting overlap with uh, posits. And I guess, you know, like the, the, the posits for me, um, is less about like the arithmetic and less about like, you know, say like the choir and Keyless accumulation and all that stuff. But, you know, I sort of view it as, uh, you know, it's, it's a form of quantization. Um, you know, like it makes an assumption about the data distribution of the data that you have. And, you know, with the idea that your, your typical data distribution, you know, would be centered around like 1.0. So you can spend more bits to, you know, like, or plus or minus one, you can spend more bits to represent numbers more, accurate, more accurately in that regime and less accurately as you go out, but still you want like a trade-off between uh, precision and dynamic range. But I think the, you know, the thing is, is that, you know, like many data distributions, you know, don't necessarily have uh, the symmetry or don't, ne are not necessarily centered around 1.0. Um, you know, I think it, we saw some of this yesterday with the, uh, like in the, um, in the weather simulation stuff where, you know, there had to be some like rescaling of the data to sort of like, you know, push it into like a better regime. You see, you know, something similar, I think, with like neural networks with uh, IEEE half precision floating point where people need to put in uh, scaling factors, you know, to get values out of the uh, like subnormal regime and other such things. So I think the, you know, the idea here, and I think the thing that's most interesting about the positive idea is like less specifically about the specific encoding, but the idea of using like entropy codes, you know, say like the, um, you know, like the uh, Elias codes or, you know, potentially even learned encodings like Huffman codes or like other such things, uh, you know, to encode, you know, say like the exponent and, you know, give you, you know, the trade-off between the dynamic range and precision between the exponent bits and the fraction bits, uh, you know, to, to minimize the uh, reproduction error that this quantizer would give you for your like, you know, floating point data. So if you, Wanted to see, you know, like what, you know, sort of like a traditional, I, ca I call like linear posit, you know, like the, the posit as was, you know, originally, you know, proposed as opposed to applying posit encoding on my like weird uh, logarithmic representation. So if you were, unfortunately, I don't have a graph of this uh, showing what this looks like for like 8-bit uh, integer quantization, like uniform integer quantization. But I think the interesting thing here is that uh, because, you know, like the posit representation has, 
you know, like gives you a, like a wide dynamic range. Uh, the actual, you know, so like this, this is showing, say, like for all positive values, you know, like zero, uh, zero to like 127, or um, showing you, you know, just sort of like taking activations in a neural network and sort of like you know bucketing, you know, like where, like what their representation is. If you were to do this with, uh, say, like 8-bit integer quantization, many of those values would be sort of like you know bucketed, you know, like would would not you really would not use a lot of the buckets. Data distributions in neural networks, you know, tend to be you know somewhat Gaussian, uh, and you know, like posits, you know, would give you sort of like a higher like entropy uh, like encoding, because they are slightly more tailored to the data distribution of the network than assuming sort of like a uniform quantization. So, uh, like in this case, you know, this is the final uh, you know classification that you get, and this is the you know the so this is a classification network on like ImageNet. Uh, at the very end here. Whatever value is sticking out here is what the network is, you know, like proposing. Uh, you know, so the um, the issue, this representation becomes an issue with uh, like neural networks here, and there's still like you know some form of like rescaling because these values out here are around, you know, say like you know 14 or 16 or something like this, um, you know, like that. You know, posit, you know, like the A1 positive representation, you know, tends not to represent it as much. So, like, you know, some, some of these tricks, you know, would, some of these scaling tricks you would still have to do with a, you know, with A1, but this is only assuming that, you know, the data distribution is, you know, like centered around, like, you know, 1.0, some, like, in rescaling, or being able to, you know, like, use, like, Huffman codes or, you know, something like that to, you know, change how you're encoding, what, what, what your encoding looks like to more, you know, closely tie it to your data distribution could be useful. And if you were to look at, um, you know, say like, you know, throughout the network, uh, you know, what the actual quantization error, you know, just, you know, like the thing that I did in my paper is just, you know, drop in, you know, say like normal posits as opposed to like uniform integer quantization. Uh, you know, like it is, you know, like the posit representations are more closely like, you know, tied to, you know, the data distributions that you would see, like neural networks, and you know the one that definitely worked the best was like eight one because it's uh, you know pretty good trade off between you know precision and dynamic range, and this you know sort of shows you this. So these are all the layers of I believe like a ResNet fifty, and sort of like looking at the activations that sort of like go through, and you know compared with these you know different uh, you know quantization techniques, you know like what the actual like error that you would get relative to say like a thirty two bit uh, floating point baseline. So like, you know, the default positive representation, I think, is, you know, quite suitable for like neural networks. Um, you know, but I think like definitely the real savings would be in, uh, you know, training situations because there are a lot of like rescaling tricks and other such techniques that people do today with a uh, high precision floating point that, you know, could potentially be avoided with by like, you know, say like a 16.1 or 16.2 uh, like representation. So, you know, sort of like, you know, combining all of this together, you know, sorry, it's been sort of like a whirlwind of, you know, a bunch of, uh, you know, stuff throwing together in the pot. But um, you, can, you can take the, the logarithmic idea that you had earlier, you can apply, you know, like the positive type encodings to like these logarithmic domain numbers as well to give you like also a better trade-off between, um, you know, like exponent, uh, between the dynamic range exponent and, you know, the fractional bits in precision. Um, when you perform computation, you know, the, the, the word width of, you know, like how you store the data in memory does not need to be the same. Assuming you have full control of the hardware, like you're building your own chip or you have an FPGA, you're free, like in your registers, you know, to sort of like, you know, store intermediate values however you want and only deal with, you know, the quantization error, uh, you know, that gets introduced, you know, when you write things out. Um, you know, I think that this is something that can be exploited. I think, you know, the, the typical problem, you know, definitely for like, you know, computer architects is that, uh, you know, they have a register, you know, like they have, you know, say like a general purpose CPU register, uh, register file that is of like, you know, fixed width and everything sort of must fit into that. You, you know, like load your operands, you do something and you, you know, write something back and everything's the same size. I think that, you know, like enabling some form of like flexibility in that, you know, could give you like a better trade-off uh, between, you know, the precision of operations and uh, like how you actually use your memory. And uh, like I'm applying all of these techniques to like, you know, training at the moment. Unfortunately, I don't have like results yet. 
But uh, you know, something for like neural network training that is very important is because this is uh, stochastic gradient descent. There's still like uh, to update your parameters at each step. You're performing this update like many many times. You need to like take your old parameters and you need to like add you know like say a value or I guess there should be a minus. Uh, you know like the the to sort of like you know follow the gradient. This is just a single addition. And you know this is this thing definitely needs to be like accurate, uh, which if you look at the slide like earlier in the presentation, adding two numbers together in my weird log representation is like less accurate. Adding more numbers together in my weird log representation is more accurate. You know this is something that you need to be accurate. This might have to be done with a traditional like logarithmic uh, number system style technique. So you know, kind of like bringing all this together, uh, you know, I think like this talk is, you know, less so about you know like this say the specific number format or you know things that you can do with it, but I think that you know there really you know like is like a long line lineage of ideas, like you know which you know I sort of jokingly call alternative math, uh, you know that can be considered in hardware, you know especially if you want to, uh, like. You know, apply these to like domain-specific architectures, and you know, like increase like efficiency. You're going to have to sort of like look under everything, you know, that we've been doing. So like many of these ideas, definitely have like a long history, but like little practical consideration designs. Uh, and by you know throwing some of the you know like strict guarantees out the window um, and allowing for like approximation, you know, like you can you know substantially like increase your energy efficiency. You know, like by you know, like say, like you know, three times, and uh, you know, by you know, combining some of these tricks together, uh, especially with you know, quantization or like more accurate accumulation, uh, like you you might actually end up you know, producing on average you know, more accurate results than you would have with you know, traditional like you know, floating point representations. And I think you know, like the you know, the thing you know, for me, you know, what what you know, like I've had to ask you know, what posits are to me, posits are you know, like really a form of you know, quantization. Um, and I think like tailoring the quantization to the data distribution that you have to minimize the reproduction error of the quantizer is you know something is the you know trick that you can really use to you know substantially reduce the memory overheads you know that you have uh, you know for you know computer arithmetic and you know combining all of these you know together um, you know using you know sort of like eight bit or sixteen bit types as opposed to you know say like sixteen thirty two or sixty four bit types. And you know, by making your operations like way more efficient in hardware, you know, I think that there's a lot that you can do to sort of you know substantially improve and you know speed up you know say like AI training and you know like broader gains. Things you know like I would not run a weather simulation or something like this on this arithmetic, you know, but I think there are many workloads you know where a combination of these techniques can be considered. Thanks. That was pretty mind blowing. Thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, we have time for just a couple questions, and I can rush this next thing so we won't miss our tea break. But uh, questions? Yeah. Um, Thank you, uh, Andrea from uh, CEA Leti in Grenoble. Um, I have just a few questions. I miss the encoding that you use to encode the logarithmics. Uh, that you do, that you use to the addition. So you, you, I guess that you use the posits as memory formats. Then uh, you want to exploit uh, a logarithmic encoding in order to uh, accelerate the additions just by doing a simple the multi accelerate the multiplication just doing by just doing a simple addition. But they miss the encoding that you use for the logarithmic representation in binary. So th without so the posits uh, are an encoding that you can apply on top. You know, like the b the basic uh, representation is a is a uh, signed uh, well, like there it's it's a doubly signed sort of like fixed point representation. You sort of like take like the take the the signed bit from a floating point representation and take the signed exponent. Um, it's that so you can represent you know like negative and positive log numbers and a special encoding for zero. Okay, I see. Thank you very much. Other questions? I want to get in one question. When you <coughs> measured your float fuse multiply adds, are you starting with log representation and winding up with linear representation, or do you in take it round trip all the way back to log representation? 
So like on the uh, chart, the like chart was earlier, all the FMAs, yeah. So like the, the 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 one earlier, it does not actually go back. But if you did go back, so like two 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 points. If you did go back, uh, that conversion is you know still like relatively cheap. But that conversion is amortized over the cost of you know like many many operations. I see. So if if you only wanted to multiply two numbers and sum it with another number, uh, I would not use this. Uh, you know I think like the the energy of, Energy and area and like other advantages here, you know, would only be seen, I you know, see. in cases more like you know linear algebra where you're you know performing right. many many sums of products. I get it. Any other questions? Uh, let's thank Jeff once more.